theCUBE's coverage of Red Hat Summit 2022. The Cube has been covering Red Hat Summit for a number of years. Of course, the last two years were virtual coverage. Now the Red Hat Summit is one of the industry's most premier events and, and typically Red Hat Summits are many thousands of people. I think the last one I went to was eight or 9,000 people. Very heavy developer conference. This year Red Hat has taken a different approach. It's a hybrid event. It's kind of a VIP event at the Westin in Boston with a lot more executives here than we would normally expect uh, versus developers, but a huge virtual audience. My name is Dave Vellante, I'm here with my co-host, Paul Gillen. Paul, this is a location that you and I have broadcast from many times. And um, of course, 2019, the summer of 2019, IBM acquired Red Hat, and um, we, of course we did Red Hat Summit that year, but now we're seeing a completely new Red Hat and a new IBM. And you wouldn't know IBM owned Red Hat for what they've been talking about at this conference. We just came out of the keynote where uh, in the, in the hour-long keynote, IBM was not mentioned once uh, and only appeared, the logo only appeared once on the screen, in fact. So this is uh, very much Red Hat being Red Hat, uh, not being a subsidiary to IBM, and perhaps that's justified given that IBM's uh, track record with acquisitions is that they gradually envelop the acquired company and, and it becomes part of the IBM board. Yeah, they blue washed the whole thing, right? <laughs> and it's ironic because IBM Think is going on right across the street. Arvind Krishna is here, but no, no presence here. And I think that's by design. I mean, it reminds me of when you know, EMC owned VMware. You know, the VMware team didn't want to publicize that. They had an ecosystem of partners that they wanted to cater to and they wanted to treat everybody equally, even though perhaps behind the scenes they were forced to do certain things that they might not have necessarily wanted to because they were owned by another company. And I think that you know, certainly IBM's done a good job of leaving the brand separate, but when they talk about the con on the conference calls, IBM's earnings calls, you certainly get a heavy dose of Red Hat. When Red Hat was acquired by IBM, it was just north of $3 billion in revenue. Obviously, IBM paid $34 billion for the company. Actually, by today's valuation, it's probably a bargain, you know, despite the market sell-off in the last several months. Uh, but now, we've heard public statements from Arvind Krishna that, that Red Hat is a $5 billion plus revenue company. It's a little unclear what's in there. Of course, when you listen to IBM earnings, you know, consulting is their big business. Red Hat's growing at 21%, but when, I remember, Paul, when Red Hat was acquired, Stu Miniman and I did a session, and I said, this is not about cloud. This is about consulting and modernizing applications, and sure, there's some cloud in there with OpenShift, but from a financial standpoint, IBM was able to take Red Hat and jam it right into its application modernization initiatives. So it's hard to tell how much of that five billion is actually you know, legacy Red Hat, but I guess it doesn't matter anymore, it's working. IBM Mathematics is uh, notoriously opaque. Uh, <laughs> they, they, if the business isn't going well, it'll tend to be absorbed into another number in the, in the earnings report that, that, do, that does show some growth. So we've heard, uh, certainly, uh, IBM talks a lot about Red Hat on its earnings calls. It's very clear that Red Hat is the growth engine within IBM. I'd say it's a bit of the tail wagging the dog right now, where Red Hat really is dictating where IBM goes with its hybrid cloud strategy, which is the foundation, not only of its technology portfolio, but of its consulting business. And so Red Hat is really in the driver's seat of, of hybrid cloud, and that's the future for IBM. And you see that very much at this conference, where uh, Red Hat is putting out its uh, series of announcements today about uh, improvements to its hybrid cloud, the new release of RHEL 9, Red Hat Enterprise Linux 9, uh, improvements to its hybrid cloud portfolio. It very much is going its own way with that, and I sense that IBM is going to go along with wherever Red Hat chooses to go. Yeah, I think um, you're absolutely right. If, you, if, By the way, if you go to siliconangle.com, Paul uh, just published a piece on uh, Red Hat, Red Hat's, their rollout, of their parade, which of course is, as you pointed out, led by en Enterprise Linux. But to your point about hybrid cloud, it is the linchpin of, uh, of certainly IBM strategy, but many companies' hybrid cloud strategies. If you think about it, OpenShift in particular, it's the, it's the modern application development environment for Kubernetes. You can get Kubernetes, you can buy EKS, you can get that for free in a lot of places, uh, but you have to do dozens and dozens of things and acquire dozens of services to do what OpenShift does, to get the reliability, the recoverability, the security, and that's really Red Hat's play. And the, the, the thing about Red Hat, combining with Linux, their, their Linux heritage, they're doing that everywhere. It's going to open shift everywhere, Red Hat everywhere, whether it's on-prem, uh, in AWS, Azure, Google, 
out to the edge. Uh, you heard Paul Cormier today saying he expects that you know, in the next several years, hardware is going to become one of the most important you know, factors. I agree, I think we're going to enter a hardware renaissance. You've seen the work that we've done on ARM. I think 2017 was when Red Hat and ARM announced kind of their initial collaboration. Could have even been before that. Today we're hearing a lot about Intel and NVIDIA. And so affinity with all of these alternative processes, I think they did throw in today in the keynote power. And yeah, see, they did. I think That's I heard true. that. That was <laughs> the other true. IBM branding. They sort of tucked that in there. But the point is Red Hat runs everywhere, so it's fundamental to building out hybrid cloud, and that is fundamental to a lot of company strategies. And Red, Shift, Red Hat has been all over Kubernetes with OpenShift. It's, I mean, it's a drumbeat here. Uh, the, the OpenShift strategy is what really makes hybrid cloud possible, because Kubernetes is what makes it possible to shift workloads seamlessly from platform to platform. You make an interesting point about hardware. We have seen kind of a renaissance in hardware these last couple of years, as these uh, specific chipsets and, uh, and even full-scale processors have come to market. We're seeing several in the AI area right now where uh, startups are developing full-blown chipsets and, and systems uh, just for AI processing. And NVIDIA, of course, that's, that's really kind of their stock and trade these days. So uh, a, a company that can run across all of those different platforms, a platform like, like uh, RHEL, which can run all across those different platforms, is going to have a leg up on, on anybody else. And, and the implications for application development are considerable when you, when you think about, we, we talk about a lot about these alternative processes. When, when Flash replaced the spinning disk, that had a huge impact on how applications are developed. Right. The developers now <laughs> didn't have to wait for that, that disk to spin, even though it's spinning very fast, it's mechanical compared to electrons, forget it. And, and the second big piece here is how memory is actually utilized. The x86, you know, traditional x86, you know, memory, everything goes through that core processor. Intel for years grabbed more and more function. And you're seeing now that function become dispersed. In fact, a lot of people think we're moving from a processor-centric world to a connect-centric world, meaning connecting all these piece parts, alternative processors, memory controllers, you know, storage controllers, I.O., net network interface cards, smart NICs, and things like that, where the communication across those resources is now where a lot of the innovation is going. You're, see, you're seeing a lot of that, and now, of course, applications can take advantage of that, especially now at the edge, which is just a whole new frontier. You know, the edge certainly is, is part of that equation. When you look at machine learning, at training machine learning models, the CPU actually does relatively little work. Most of it is happening in GPUs, in these parallel processes that are going on, and the CPU is kind of acting as a traffic cop. And you see that in the edge as well. It's, a, it's the same model at the edge, where more of the intelligence is going to be out in discrete devices, spread across the network, and the CPU is going to be less of a, uh, you know, less of an engine of, of, of intelligence. At the same time, though, we've got CPUs with, we've got 100 core CPUs are on the horizon, and there are even 200 and 300 core CPUs that we may see in the next, uh, in the next couple of years. So CPUs aren't standing still, they are evolving to become uh, really kind of super traffic cops for all of these other processors out in the network and, and on the edge. So it's a very exciting time to be in hardware because so much innovation is happening uh, really at the microprocessor level. Well we saw this, you and I lived through the PC era and we saw a whole raft of applications come about as a result of the microprocessor, the shift to the microprocessor based economy. We're going to see, some, we are seeing something similar with mobile and the edge. Yeah, I mean, just think about some of the numbers. If you think about the traditional Moore's law, doubling a number of transistors every, let's call it two years, 18 to 24 months, Pat Gelsinger at Intel promises that Intel is on that pace still, but if you look at the Apple M1 Ultra, they increased the transistor density 6X in the last 15 months. Okay, so whereas the, another data point is the historical Moore's Law curve is 40%, it's moderating to somewhere down, you know, down in the low 30s. If you look at the Apple A series, I mean, that thing is on average increasing performance at 110% a year when you add up into the combinatorial factors of the CPU, the neural processing unit, the GPU, all the accelerators. So we are seeing a new era. The thing I, I, I wanted to bring up, Paul, is you mentioned AI. Much of the AI work that's done today is modeling that's done in the cloud. And when we talk about edge, we think that the future of AI is AI inferencing in real time at the edge. 
So you may not even be persisting that data, but you're going to create a lot of data, you're going to be operating on that data in streams, and it's going to require a whole new, new architectural thinking of hardware. Very low cost, very low power, very high performance, to drive all that intelligence at the edge, and a lot of that data is going to stay at the edge. And, and that's, we're going to talk about some of that today with some of the EV innovations and the vehicle innovations and the intelligence in these vehicles. Yeah, and in, in talking in its edge strategy, which it outlined today, and in the announcements that it made today, Red Hat very much uh, uh, playing to the importance of being able to run Red Hat Enterprise Linux at the edge. The idea is you do these big machine learning models centrally, and then you, you, take the, you take what results from that and you move it out to smaller processors. It's the only way we can cope with the, with the explosion of data that will be uh, that these sensors and other devices will be generating. So some of the themes we're hearing in the uh, announcements today that you wrote about, Paul, obviously RHEL 9 is huge, uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux version 9, uh, new capabilities, a lot of edge, a lot of security, uh, new cross portfolio capabilities for the edge, security in the software supply chain, there's a big conversation, especially post solar winds. Managed Ansible, when you think about Red Hat, you really, I think anyway, about three things, RHEL, which is, which is Linux, it powers the internet, powers everything. Uh, you think of OpenShift, which is application development, you think about Ansible, which is automation, so IT ops. So that's one of the announcements, Ansible on Azure, um, and then a lot of hi hybrid cloud talk, and you're going to hear a lot of talk this week about Red Hat's cloud services portfolio, packaging Red Hat as services, as managed services, that's you know, a much more popular delivery mechanism with clients, because they're trying to make it easy. And this is complicated stuff, and it gets more complicated the more features they add, uh, and the more, com the more uh, components of the Red Hat portfolio uh, are, 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 uh, are available. It's, it's, it's getting to be complex to build these hybrid clouds. So, like many of these, so the Cube started doing physical events last summer, by the way, and so this is, this is new to a lot of people, uh, they're, they're here for the first time, people are really excited. We've definitely noticed a trend. People are excited to be back together. Paul Cormier talked about that. He talked about the new normal. You can define the new normal any way you want. So Paul Cormier gave, gave the, uh, the, the intro keynote. Ashesh Badani interviewed Amex. Stephanie Chiris interviewed Accenture. Both those firms are coming on. Stephanie's coming on with an Accenture as well. Matt Hicks talked about product innovation. I loved his reference to Ada Lovelace. Uh, that was very cool. He talked about uh, Srinivasa uh, 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 Ramanujan, a uh, famous mathematician who nobody knew about when he was just a kid. These were ignored individuals in the 1800s for years and years and years in the case of Ada Lovelace for a century even. He asked the question, what if we had discovered them earlier and acted on them and been able to iterate on them earlier? And his point tied that to open source very brilliantly, I thought. And um, keynotes, which I appreciate, are much shorter. Much than shorter, what we've had much in more history. intimate. They did a keynote in the round this time, uh, which I haven't seen before. There's yeah. maybe a thousand people in there, so a much smaller group, much more intimate setting. Not a lot of back and forth, but uh, but it, it, there there is a feeling of a more personal feel to this event than I've seen at past Red Hat summits. Yeah, and I think that's a trend that we're going to see more of where. The live audience is kind of the on the ground, it's kind of the VIP audience, but still catering to the virtual audience. You don't want to lose them, so that's why the keynotes are a lot tighter. Okay, Paul, thank you for setting up uh, Red Hat Summit 2022. You're watching theCUBE's coverage. We'll be right back, wall-to-wall -wall coverage for two days, right after this short break.